If you're in business, you probably have a website, but can your site handle your growth? How many visitors before your site slows down or crashes? What about storage and data security? From web hosting to virtual servers, Pair Networks provides the online infrastructure you need to start, grow, and flourish. When it comes to security and updates, don't worry, we've got you covered. Our 24-7 U.S.-based customer support is the best in the industry. No frustrating chatbots are sitting on hold for hours. Check out Pair.com today to learn more. That's P-A-I-R dot com. Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hey, everyone. It's Susan Coffin, and you are listening to Attitude Magazine's ADHD Experts Audio. Today, we're talking about bipolar disorder. It's a very misunderstood condition that can look a lot like ADHD, This is Attitude's third of a series of webinars designed for ADHD clinicians. If you're not a clinician, you're welcome to listen in, and we suggest you may want to share this information with your clinician after the webinar. About 20% of people with ADHD also suffer from bipolar disorder, which is a quite serious mental illness characterized by alternating depressive and manic episodes. Since both conditions share some symptoms, and ADHD is much more common, bipolar disorder is often missed or misdiagnosed. In fact, many patients don't receive an accurate diagnosis of bipolar disorder until adulthood, even though their symptoms commonly begin in in childhood. In addition, um, patients with both ADHD and bipolar disorder are at quite high risks for more severe symptoms of both conditions. So an accurate diagnosis is pretty important. We're so happy to have Dr. Robert Olivardia. He'll be discussing how depressive and manic episodes of bipolar disorder are different from ADHD-related mood states, the risks associated with a dual diagnosis of both ADHD and bipolar disorder, and some thoughts about the best treatment team and plan for patients with ADHD, with bipolar disorder, or with both. Um, Dr. Olivardio is a clinical instructor of psychology at the Harvard Medical School and a clinical associate at McLean Hospital in Belmont, Massachusetts. He has a private psychotherapy practice in Lexington, Massachusetts, where he specializes in the treatment of ADHD, body dysmorphic disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. He is on the advisory board for Attitude Magazine and the professional advisory board for CHAD, the National Attention Deficit Disorder Organization. Dr. Alvardi, thank you so much for joining us today. Our sponsor this week is Omega Bright. Omega Bright is a 100% natural advanced omega-3 formula, which delivers high EPA benefits for cognitive clarity and positive mood. Formulated over 16 years ago, Omega Bright continues to set the gold standard for purity, for concentration, and for scientific efficacy in omega-3s. Omega Bright is currently available exclusively by toll-free phone 1-800-383. 2030 or at their website, omegabright.com. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Dolvardia again with our thanks for being here today. And thank you for having me. It's always my pleasure to be speaking at these Attitude webinars. And this is a topic that I have a a lot of passion about because I've seen, unfortunately, uh, the consequences of misdiagnosis on either end, either patients uh, who have come in with a diagnosis of ADHD who uh, turn out also or have a uh, don't have ADHD and have a bipolar disorder or also have a bipolar disorder, as well as the opposite. Patients I've treated with bipolar illness who, uh, it turns out, have ADHD, and that has been missed. And once that has been adequately diagnosed, uh, the treatment can really progress in a very positive manner. As mentioned earlier, the prevalence rates suggest a very high, what we call a comorbidity or a co-occurrence, that 20% of people with ADHD have bipolar disorder, and about 60 to 70 percent of people with bipolar disorder uh, are diagnosed, could be diagnosed with ADHD. So it's uh, something that if one is diagnosed with one, it, uh, they should always be assessed for the other, given that high comorbidity rate. The problem with bipolar disorder in particular, 
is it's often misdiagnosed or diagnosed as depression, anxiety, um, ADHD. And studies show it can take up to 17 years for someone to get the appropriate adequate diagnosis of a bipolar disorder. And as you'll see, that this is a serious mental illness with serious consequences um, that really where 17 years is uh, 17 years too long to be adequately diagnosed. So I'm going to uh, speak in terms of what we're actually talking about when we talk about bipolar disorder, because a lot of what people generally know is what might be shown or depicted in Hollywood films, some of which are accurate and some of which are not. And of uh, most of the time is not the complete picture of the range of bipolar spectrum disorders that we see. So by bipolar disorder, we're referring to a category of symptoms, including depressive symptoms and what we call manic or hypomanic symptoms. So by depressive symptoms, these are symptoms characterized by individuals who feel a very low mood state. They have a loss of interest of things that they used to have a lot of pleasure for and a lot of interest for. You'll often see uh, vast dysregulations of their appetite whether it's uh, an increase in their appetite or a total decrease or shutdown of their appetite, as well as uh, significant weight gain or weight loss. Uh, a lot of sleeping issues, again, either sleeping much more than normal or uh, sleeping too little. Physical agitation or slowing down, and that's important because depression isn't always in a vegetative state that some people when they're depressed can actually look quite anxious where they're physically agitated, um, but they're not anxious, they're actually depressed. Uh, feelings of fatigue and a lot of cognitive components to depression, including a feeling of worthlessness or feeling guilty for things that one really shouldn't feel guilty about, uh, difficulty concentrating and recurrent thoughts of death or suicide. Now, what's important is that with all of these symptoms, we can look at some of these and we can understand why they might be mistaken for ADHD. Uh, people with ADHD often can get interested in things and lose interest very quickly. We will often see dysregulations of appetite, uh, certainly sleep disorders and erratic sleep, uh, physical agitation in the form of fidgeting and hyperactivity, uh, sometimes a fatigue that's associated with inattentiveness. Uh, and certainly difficulty concentrating. The difference is that with the depression, it is not, with ADHD rather, it's very contextual that uh, this, somebody might say, yes, I have a loss of interest because I just grew bored of doing uh, skateboarding, let's say, and now I'm on to something else. With depression, it's not that way. It's, I feel uh, sort of not interested in anything. I'm not even on to the next thing. It's something that I really, really enjoy and when I'm not depressed, I still enjoy. Um, with depression, it feels like an overall sort of cloud, an overall state that feels very, uh, almost something that's coming from sort of almost an internal state sort of spilling out. Whereas people with ADHD uh, are very much people who respond from the external in. So if the environment provides the right stimulation, internally, they're going to be in a pretty good mood state. If the environment does not provide the adequate stimulation, they're going to be bored, they might be agitated. But with a clinical depression, it's going from the inside out. So there's almost no rhyme or reason sometimes why people feel depressed. They sometimes they'll complain about waking up feeling that way. And that's a very accurate uh, way of looking at it, that it's often very episodic as opposed to contextual. That, um, and then again, when people are not depressed, they are fundamentally different than when they are depressed. They're oriented to the world in a very different way. Whereas people with ADHD will often say that they always feel that way. Their sort of sensibility, their orientation to the world is the same. It's just they know themselves maybe to be people who, um, you know, maybe have intensity of mood states and, and whatnot, but it's it doesn't feel unlike them. When people who struggle with depression, with a bipolar disorder, when they feel depressed, they feel very characteristically different than who uh, they normally are. They don't they don't feel like themselves. Nothing about them of what they connect to feels like them. The other thing is that with ADHD, it feels more in control, that maybe somebody is feeling fatigue 
because uh, you know they're they're specifically tired, or maybe again nothing in the environment is offering them something. But there's a sense that if they can find that thing that is stimulating, then that mood state can change r- rather quickly. With depression, it doesn't work that quickly, um, if at all. That it can feel almost impossible sometimes for people to find anything that gives them a sense of joy or or connection. And similarly, to get out of that state. It can be easier for someone with ADHD, again, given the right external stimulation with depression. It just it's so coming from an internal place that it almost doesn't matter what happens on the outside. Now, in addition to depressive symptoms, we have what we call manic or hypomanic symptoms. And by a mania, we're referring to a severe change in mood where someone is either extremely irritable or overly silly and elated. So a Hollywood version of mania is the person who's in a great mood. They feel like life is awesome. They're not sleeping at all for five days straight. They're spending lots of money. That could be one form of a mania. But a mania can also be what we call a more agitated mania, where someone feels completely irritable. Um, they um, Patients report that they want to literally jump out of their skin. They, they just cannot settle. There's a sense that there's just no grounding. And again, this is not, this is completely irregardless of what's happening externally. It just is from the inside out. Um, they'll report just never feeling comfortable that they're, they have almost this like increased revved up energy, but it feels very out of control. It feels like the energy is, is not an energy that they find very pleasant. Uh, they might have an overly inflated self-esteem and sometimes uh, feelings of grandiosity, feeling like they have almost like magical powers. You'll often see sometimes narcissistic traits or features when people are in this mood state that they can do anything and be anything. Um, They will have a decreased need for sleep, sometimes for up to a week without feeling tired. And that's what's very different than with ADHD is that people with ADHD might have a decreased need for sleep when they're in a period of hyper-focus or when they're really interested in something or there's a sense of urgency to get a college paper done and they're up for the entire night. But once that paper is done, they're crashing. They're completely exhausted. They're tired. And if if a professor told them in the middle of that, hey, guess what? You have a week now to do this paper, that person can most likely say, oh, great, and disconnect from the paper and go to bed. That is not what happens in a manic or hypomanic episode. The person, again, and it's almost it's regardless of what's happening externally, although you could be triggered by external environments and what's happening externally, but it's this internal sense that the body is not settling. It's just not settling at all. And it feels people when they're in a manic in the throes of a manic episode, certainly at the beginning of it, actually want to go to sleep, that they wish they can go to sleep, but and they'll go to bed and they just feel like their body is almost just there's this electricity going through their body. Um, And again, it can be up to a week and your mind goes into very dark and serious places when you don't sleep for a week to the point where you can start getting psychotic, that you can start having hallucinations and, and just your thinking just gets more and more bizarre. Um, Increased talking, talking too much, too fast, changing topics too quickly, and talking in such a way that you can't be interrupted. Now, someone could hear that and think, well, yeah, that describes a lot of people with ADHD, absolutely. But this is a more uncontrolled, unboundaried sort of sense. If even the person themselves, if they're insightful at the beginning of the sort of emergence of a manic or hypomanic episode, will know that they're sort of doing that. They, They know that they're sort of talking too fast sometimes, and that Maybe they're even putting people off, but they just can't stop it. There's no way. And the changing the topics is almost just feels just random and without any sort of linearity to it. Um, And again, the key, as I mentioned with the depressive symptoms, is this is when people are in a manic or hypomanic state, this is uncharacteristic of them. In other words, when they're not manic or hypomanic, these are not symptoms that describe them. For people with ADHD, they may always be people who have an increased sort of hyperactivity or revved up energy. That's consistent for them. That is sort of who they are in a lot of ways. Um, They might be people who are hyperverbal on a consistent regular basis. It's nothing new. With a manic or hypomanic episode, this is more. It's a change. It's a shift from how somebody normally is.
Now, in addition, people with manic uh, symptoms will talk about having racing thoughts, being extremely distractible. Um, And again, understandable why we would think that ADHD could be misdiagnosed for this. But when people who are manic will say that their thoughts are almost as if like there are a bunch of birds flying past them, but they're flying so fast that they can't even identify the color of the bird, what the bird even looks like, which is very different than people with ADHD who might have a lot of fast thinking and fast thoughts, but they're aware of them. They can see the birds, they can see the color and they can say, oh yes, there's a blue bird and it has really big wings and there's a red bird and it has really short wings. Oh, and there's a big eagle flying in the air. So they're able to kind of grasp and anchor into those racing thoughts. That is not the case with the manic, uh, the manic episodes, the people who, uh, when they have these sort of racing thoughts, they feel like it's almost this just noise in their head that they have no, that's taking over them, that again, they're not in the driver's seat of it. People with ADHD will sometimes, uh, will often entertain sometimes those racing thoughts and sort of feel uh, a sense of fluidity and alignment with those thoughts. With mania, it's not that way at all. It's almost like it's sort of coming over them and it's almost being in, uh, they're almost assaulted by the thoughts as opposed to sort of going with them in some ways. The distractibility is not due to, oh, this thing is interesting and that's why I'm orienting myself to it as what you would see with ADHD. The distractibility is, could be things that when you're not in a manic episode, don't distract you. So, you, you know, things that normally wouldn't, that now suddenly are distracting you visually or having this acute auditory sense of any tiny little sound. Um, And again, that is not characteristic of how somebody typically is. Uh, You'll often see hypersexuality that is not sort of normal in terms of for that individual. Sometimes you'll see this increased goal-directed activity or physical agitation. Sometimes people do get a lot of stuff done when they're in a manic episode. Um, And initially, it can be quite productive for them. And then eventually, with less and less sleep, it becomes less and less productive. And people when they're in uh, in a mania can sometimes disregard uh, a lot of sort of behaviors and that uh, are rules that we sort of live by and sometimes get involved in very risky behaviors or illegal activities. Now, in addition, those are what we call sort of the bipolar one disorder, which are these episodic depressive or manic episodes. So that typically it might last three to four days and then the person might crash into a depressive episode and and we sort of see that cycle in this cyclical way. But for most people with bipolar disorder, it doesn't sort of work that neatly, so to speak, where you can say, oh, okay, I'm in a depressive episode, I'm in a manic episode. And there's uh, another diagnosis called the bipolar two diagnosis, which affects about one to 2% of the US population of which bipolar one also uh, affects. And it's more characterized by hypomanic episodes. And what I mean by a hypomanic episode is it's sort of like, like light, quote unquote, light mania, but there's, um, I don't want to suggest that hypomania is less disabling than a mania because actually that's not true. Um, but it's just that the symptoms aren't as loud and they're not as intense, which actually calls for and often uh, creates more misdiagnosis because again, it can look like anxiety. It can, whereas if somebody's up for seven days straight and they think they're Jesus Christ uh, and they're psychotic, there's it, it's it's a no-brainer at that point that they're in the throes of a manic episode. But let's say if somebody is just getting two hours of sleep every night and they feel sort of revved up and they're productive, but maybe not as much, and they're they're thinking it's a little bit sort of different than it normally is, it could be hard sometimes to say that's a hypomanic episode versus this is someone who's just really hyperactive. So with the bipolar two, you see more the hypomanic, but actually you see more depressive episodes. And people with bipolar two are more likely to get diagnosed as having a unipolar depression or what we call a major depressive disorder. And there's a big difference between a major depressive disorder and a bipolar disorder, which I'll talk about later in regards to medication. Uh, Bipolar two tends to affect more women. It's marked by a tremendous amount of anxiety. So people with bipolar two often get misdiagnosed as having anxiety and depression, when in fact it's a bipolar two disorder, which is characterized by depressive episodes and uh, severe anxiety. 
People with bipolar 2 tend to have a high rejection sensitivity. You'll often see uh, per certain personality disorders and significant morbidity, meaning that the risks um, and in terms of suicide and things like that is no less with bipolar 2. It's actually can be more disabling. And then we have the sort of category we call NOS or not otherwise specified, which refers to the bipolar spectrum disorders where people don't fit neatly in these episodes, but may have what's called a mixed episode, meaning in the course of a day, they could be experiencing both manic and depressive symptoms. Um, and that's actually often seen as the worst prognosis of bipolar spectrum disorders is the mixed state. Uh, but you can have individuals who kind of are sub-threshold, and so it's very very important that we understand that this can really exist on a spectrum. The greatest risk with a bipolar illness is suicide, that people with bipolar disorder are 15 times greater than the general population to commit suicide. And in fact, one in five people with this disorder will kill themselves, and half of people with this disorder will attempt suicide. Um, and that suicides are actually more likely to happen in the manic phase, not the depressive phase. And part of that is explained that when someone is so depressed, oftentimes you'll see a cognitive vegetation where someone is not even able to think through a plan of suicide. And when they're more manic and they have all the energy and they're more impulsive and they're disregarding of sort of risky activities, they're more likely to carry out um, a suicide. And oftentimes when people are in a manic episode, they're so fearful of getting back to a depressive state that they'd rather, in a sense, uh, commit suicide when they're on that high. Um, bipolar 2 is actually characterized by more lethal suicide attempts than bipolar 1. And people with this illness have a 10-year less life expectancy. Part of that, obviously, with suicide, but also due to bad self-care, to drug addiction, which affects many people with bipolar disorder self-medicate with drugs and alcohol and in fact don't get adequately diagnosed because um, they often are addicts and have to get clean and sober before it becomes clear that there's an underlying mental illness. So in terms of a differential diagnosis, someone is more likely, if someone's questioning, is this ADHD is this bipolar disorder? It's more likely to be bipolar disorder if the symptoms are not apparent at birth. Unlike ADHD, if you ask parents who have children with ADHD, what their children were like as infants, you will often hear stories of, oh my gosh, from the moment they were born, they were colicky, they couldn't get to sleep, they were just always crying, or, or they're always moving around. Even in the womb, they were kicking me more than my non-ADHD children were. You hear sort of these kind of symptoms um, that are apparent because ADHD is, not, is something that we're born with. With bipolar disorder, it's something that develops. And so you start to, those symptoms aren't really there from birth. There may be features in childhood, and sometimes there aren't those strong, prominent features in childhood. Um, you'll often see a higher chronicity of impairment. Bipolar disorder can be quite impairing. And again, the mood dysregulation is random or cyclical versus contextual. I have some patients who we document uh, their manic and depressive episodes, and it's almost they can get to a point where they can almost predict when it's going to happen because it's that cyclical. That's not the case with every patient. Um, with women, I always tell women to also track their menstrual cycle, and you'll often see for women who have bipolar disorder that there's often a correlation between uh, depressive episodes and the pre or manic episodes and the premenstrual phase uh, versus when they're actually uh, start their period versus periods of ovulation that you'll often see uh, these hormonal fluctuations that really can play a part in triggering uh, this. Now, the good thing about that is that once you're able to track that, you can there are things proactively to do in terms of managing your life to really prevent an episode from really coming on. The mood shifts in bipolar disorder are rapid and quite intense. So uh, the difference between an ADHD uh, child or adolescent who is tantruming and a bipolar adolescent who's tantruming is very different. The bipolar adolescent is raging for what could be hours and hours where it's scary, where it's disturbing. They can be destructive. Um, you don't see that as much with ADHD, where an individual with ADHD will uh, maybe be upset and be, you know, tantruming, but either A, if they're distracted by something else, or at some point they just get exhausted. With a bipolar child or adolescent, it's almost like there's no limit to that just volcanic 
emotion. It just comes and comes and comes and comes. It's what's referred to as a limbic rage, limbic referring to our limbic system, which is the part of our brain, the most primitive emotional part of our brain. People are more likely to have bipolar disorder if the duration of their mood shifts are longer. So with ADD, even if somebody is really intensely upset, they're more likely to get out of it quicker than what you will see in a, in a depressive episode. Certainly a family history of bipolar disorder, and I always ask patients, is anyone diagnosed with bipolar disorder? And many times people will say no. That doesn't mean that there isn't, there aren't family members that have bipolar disorder. They just might not have been diagnosed. So I'll ask, do you have, have you ever had a family family member or extended family member commit suicide, been institutionalized, received electroconvulsive shock therapy, um, basically been so disabled that they're on disability and they're housebound. And then often that's when you'll get some of the information. I had a patient a couple of years ago um, who had bipolar and had so much shame around having bipolar disorder and thought that something was just wrong with him. And he said, no one in my family seems to have this. And I asked those same questions. And it turns out that mother had two brothers that committed suicide and mother's mother, so his maternal grandmother, was institutionalized at a time, you know, years ago when she was obviously not diagnosed. She was just diagnosed with a quote unquote nervous breakdown. These are sort of the words that you'll often hear that give people sort of a certain flavor that this is probably an undiagnosed bipolar illness. Psychosis, you don't see psychosis in ADHD, you'll see it in bipolar disorder. The thinking gets very loose and slippery, sometimes all out delusions. I am Jesus Christ, I have superpowers, I can read your thoughts. But sometimes a psychosis is just, it's more subtle, um, where it could be someone who just has a very flat affect, very blunted affect, um, and can have these sort of thinking in, in sort of bizarre thought patterns that are more than just the kind of random loose associations that people with ADHD might have. You see more destructiveness and violence, more aggressive and primitive behavior, higher sensitivity to being triggered, grandiosity, and certainly people with bipolar disorder respond very well to mood stabilizers. Just a brief note on children, that there's a lot of research now that's really looking at, you know, it does bipolar disorder exist in children? The answer is yes. Um, how common is it? That's where the jury is, is still out in terms of trying to understand this. We do know that adults who were diagnosed with bipolar disorder were very likely to have been diagnosed with ADHD as children. Now, it could mean that they also have ADHD, but for I've seen certainly a number of patients who do not have ADHD, but were diagnosed as such, who in fact have bipolar disorder. What some characteristics, and this is really still in the making um, of children who tend to exhibit these traits tend to actually be quite precocious, gifted children, often have night terrors, like dreams that are characterized by a lot of gore and mutilation, and it's very scary to them. They have an extreme fear of annihilation and death, and often we'll talk about death and murder and suicide almost uh, sometimes in a very matter of fact way that sort of leaves parents wondering what is going on here. Um, sometimes it can be harmful to animals and exhibit hallucinations and psychotic symptoms of paranoia, uh, even at a young age. When people have both, uh, that basically both disorders are worse when someone has both. If an untreated, I should say, because I also want to leave people who do have both or who have either one of these to walk away from this webinar with hope that honestly the biggest obstacle to a, a, a good prognosis is an adequate diagnosis. Once you get an adequate diagnosis that is appropriate and you get the right interventions, you can live a wonderfully healthy, thriving life with a bipolar disorder or bipolar disorder and ADHD. So you have to keep in mind that all of these statistics are based upon populations of people who the majority of which have not been adequately diagnosed until 15, 20 years have gone by, of which there's a tremendous amount of collateral damage that's done. So people who have both find that they have more ADHD symptoms than people who just have ADHD. You'll see an earlier age of onset for the bipolar disorder. So that's when uh, the young people, young teenagers that I've seen um, or children that I've seen who have bipolar disorder do tend to also have ADHD. So there's something about the combination of both that pops out the bipolar disorder earlier. They also are more likely to have additional psychiatric disorders, 
and have a higher morbidity. Uh, so there's a lot more serious sort of symptoms with it. As adults, they're more likely to be on disability, certainly a higher suicide rate. So this is a population that is extremely important to pay attention to because the risk of suicide is higher. Now, I told you what the risk was for someone with just bipolar disorder. So now bipolar disorder and ADHD, the risk is even higher than that. So if 50% of people with bipolar disorder attempt suicide, we don't know the statistics for both, but we know that anecdotally it's definitely higher and a poor overall functioning for people who have both. Now, psychopharmacologically, it's extremely important to have a, an adequate diagnosis because the medications are completely different. So for a bipolar disorder, there are three main classes of medications. The mood stabilizers, which is lithium, which are tend to be more indicated for a bipolar one disorder, the more classically episodic, weak lung of depression and week-long manias and things like that. The anticonvulsants, which include uh, Depakote, Integritol, and Lamictal, those could be for bipolar one, but also could be more indicated for a bipolar two or more of a bipolar spectrum disorder. And the antipsychotics like Zyprexa and Geodon and Risperidol. And basically how these function, which are very different than antidepressant medications, is that they help with kind of the bottoms and the tops, meaning that they prevent people from getting low in the course of a depression, and it almost caps them in a way that they don't get high in the sort of sense of a mania. Antidepressants don't work on the high part. They help with sort of the low part. But interestingly, what's so important is that SSRIs, which are the class of medications that are indicated for major depressive disorders, often make a bipolar disorder much worse. So if you are diagnosed with a depression, when in fact what you have is a bipolar depression or a bipolar disorder, and you're given SSRIs, your bipolar disorder is going most likely going to get much worse. And that, again, it speaks to some of the bad the, the negative prognosis that we see in these factors is if somebody is, is on a medication that really not only is not helping them, but it's actually making their illness worse, um, you're going to see a lot of damage from that. So, so important. For ADHD, of course, we have the stimulants like Ritalin and Adderall, non-stimulants like Stratera, and atypical antidepressants like Wellbutrin. Now, what's important though is that for people who have both, they can, uh, not, not all people, the, all of my patients who have both bipolar disorder and ADHD can take a stimulant. The stimulant can make uh, their bipolar disorder worse, often triggering a manic episode. That's not always the case though. I have some patients where, because their manic episodes are often triggered by the chaos of their ADHD symptoms and the executive dysfunction of their ADHD symptoms, when they take a stimulant, because it's helping them with that, they're less likely to engage and in, in sort of get into a manic or a depressive episode. Um, but that's not always the case. For some patients, no matter what, that they take a stimulant and yes, it might help them focus, but then they it just it basically blows the cap off of uh, that top for them. So in terms of psychological treatment, of course, we want to monitor and manage the ADHD to prevent or minimize the bipolar disorder. So it's very, very important because higher ADHD symptoms lead to an easier ability for a depressive or manic episode to be triggered. Uh, sleep deprivation is uh, one of the leading uh, triggers for uh, a manic or depressive episode. Self-esteem and not carrying shame around either or both of these uh, diagnoses, and definitely getting support and understanding. So I'm going to stop there and open up for questions. Thank you so much. That was a interesting overview. There's a lot there. So um, what is the, the, what's your advice for helping with diagnosis? I mean, I think you've given an overview which describes the symptoms, but at a, at a practical level, when should someone be seeking out um, the possibility of a bipolar diagnosis? There are a number of parents who are specifically wondering about how they, sh they can tell if their children um, who've been diagnosed with ADHD might also have a mood disorder. Yes, that I think that first it's always important just to kind of keep that. I mean, with ADHD, we know that 
um, a co-occurring disorder is the rule rather than the exception. So whether it's a mood disorder, we know that a third of people with ADHD have anxiety disorders, um, that it's always important when you are, uh, when you have a child with ADHD, if you yourself have ADHD, to just keep in mind that there's a possibility that something else could be uh, accompanying it. 50 to 60 percent of people with ADD have learning disabilities. So it's important that it's more when you start to see um, a lot of times parents will say that they knew that something was going on from a mood disorder perspective when they started feeling um, like more scared by the sort of mood shifts where it felt almost that they sensed that it was uncontained even for them, um, where their children would actually uh, express a lot of remorse and almost like say things like, I, I don't know, I wasn't in my right mind, um, or that it's something that they even sense is sort of char uncharacteristic of them, that something is kind of taking over. Um, and it's hard because it's not always that the bipolar disorder will express itself in its fullest manner. Um, so it's, it's very important that if you're working with an ADHD therapist to make sure that um, basically that you're doing a lot of the cognitive behavioral work in terms of mood management and how to self-soothe um, to basically be mindful of how does your body feel, um, where are your thoughts you know, going. A lot of times um, children might have and harbor a lot of negative uh, thoughts or suicidal thinking that they never express until they're early in their college years because they just think it's too bizarre. So encouraging sort of a lot of thinking of uh, almost normalizing that all of us have lots of different thoughts and thinking and, and you know, just to be open about what it is and where your thoughts go. Um, but it's really when you start to see it get in the way where it's just almost like they're so stuck in it. Um, like it's something that they can't sort of get out of very quickly. And you know, making sure that you're doing that um, that sort of cognitive behavioral work, working, and then if you notice, for example, that your child gets less sleep, that they're they're irritable the next day, you're going to see that with any child. Um, but if if for your child you see them completely dysregulated, like completely, like they're almost just a different person. Again, it doesn't solidify that it's a bipolar uh, diagnosis, but it's sort of data. And it's important to you know, speak with your child's therapist around just sharing all of those observable behaviors um, and first asking them if they have experience working with depression, with bipolar disorder, with, and uh, making sure that they can understand it and they can assess it. And if they can, then maybe having an independent evaluation of someone who has expertise in mood disorders to to sort of just look out for that. Again, on this topic of how to diagnose, um, questions about are, are there rating scales and does a neuropsych evaluation help? So I think these are two questions that indicate that you know, these are the typical kinds of tools that are used to diagnose ADHD, um, neuropsych and, and rating scales. Is there any information that comes from that kind, those tools that would help with indicate bipolar, or does a different route need to be taken if, if this is on the parent's mind? It's a good question. Um, I, I'm not aware. The, the issue or, the, or the, the difficulty with rating scales is that a lot of rating scales can produce uh, either false positives or false negatives. So, for example, if you have uh, a rating scale for a bipolar disorder that says, do you uh, lose interest, let's say if it's assessing for depression, do you lose interest in things um, often? Someone with ADHD might say, absolutely, um, but it doesn't mean they're depressed. It's because people with ADD get bored, you know, very quickly, mm -hmm. uh, sort of move on to the next thing. Um, if it says, do you feel like, do people tell you that that you um, are quite intense or energetic all the time. And people with ADHD might say, yeah, all the time people say that um, to me. That doesn't mean that you're manic. And so I, I'm not aware of, now there may be, but I'm not aware, and I'll certainly look into this um, because I always, one of the great things that I love about doing these webinars are questions that people ask that, and that make me sort of go out and do some more research on it. But my, um, my guess and sort of what I'm aware of right now is that a lot of those rating skills aren't um, they, when, when they were making bipolar disorder, mood disorder rating skills, they didn't have ADHD in mind. They didn't have ADHD as a differential diagnosis to really sort of tease out 
that, yes, you're going to have a pool of people who can respond yes to these things who do not have bipolar disorder. They have ADHD. So, for right. example, I remember um, the, Ro the Rorschach test. People might be familiar with the ink blot test, um, that it's actually a very, very well-validated scientific um, tool in terms of assessing certain personality features and certain um, subconscious thoughts that people have. And I remember in graduate school, um, so most of those ink blots are black and white, and then there are some that have uh, spots of red on them. And how people respond to those cards uh, sort of indicates certain things about them that have actually been very well empirically studied. But one of the things is that the red if people respond to it in a certain way, at a certain frequency, might lean itself more towards a bipolar diagnosis. Now, I can tell you right now, I've, and I've actually researched this, there's not one study that has looked at Rorschach responses from people with ADHD. And right. I guarantee you, and I've seen this, that I've had patients that I've tested who do not have bipolar disorder, but have ADHD who respond to the red, because it's red out of a black and white picture. <laughs> I mean, you guys say more. <laughs> right, right. So, so it's things like that that we have. And I share the frustration with a lot of parents and people who are like, well, we as a mental health field, we are not caught up on this, this relationship of bipolar and ADHD because I find right. that lots of people who specialize in bipolar disorder don't really have a solid fundamental understanding of ADHD. And many people who are, uh, you know, do work with ADHD might not have as much of that information or uh, patient, the patients that they work with who also have bipolar disorder. So we need to sort of bridge that a lot more. So a lot of it in terms of my own clinical practice is really having a full, thorough, comprehensive clinical interview. Neuropsych testing won't really show bipolar disorder. I mean, neuropsych testing can show that somebody's cognitive processing is, you know, a certain way, but it's only going to test where that person is at that very moment. So if someone's in a depressive episode, neuropsychologically, they're going to have more depressed scores. Their, their working right. memory, their cognitive processing is going to be lower than normal. You get them in a manic state, you'll see something very different. Um, so so neuropsych testing wouldn't really be, it's really a lot of the observable behavior and really asking the right questions. So when someone, um, you know, I had a patient some years ago who was diagnosed, he came in with a diagnosis of ADHD and said that he had one of the um, quote unquote types of ADHD that is characterized by having a fiery temper. Um, you know, I forgot the term that he used. And when in turn he did he did not have ADHD at all actually he had a very severe bipolar disorder but he had been wow. diagnosed by yeah. somebody who was an ADHD expert who said you have this sort of like fiery temper you know intense form of ADHD and he was on stimulants and for 15 years this guy's life was hellish um, and uh, characterized by multiple suicide attempts, drug addiction. Mm -hmm. And when I had assessed him and really clinically asked these questions, it turns out there was he did not have ADHD. He had a pretty raging bipolar disorder and he was put on the right medication and his life got a lot better very quickly. So it's, it's really, it's again that, and if, if the therapist you're working with doesn't have a lot of that experience, that's okay, but I would then find someone in addition, not in place of, because it's important to keep the ADHD treatment and someone who knows ADHD, because if you see someone who's an expert in mood disorders but doesn't understand ADHD and you also have ADHD, you're losing a part of your treatment as well. So I have some um, patients in some parts of the country or people that I consult with who sometimes have to almost build a team of people to really adequately address all the pieces of the puzzle. Makes huge sense. And, and, and if, as you say, 20% of people who were diagnosed with ADHD have bipolar disorder, then it's a serious problem to have this this the schism between those who know bipolar and those who know ADHD and not understanding the relationship between the two because Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Because yeah. I um, find that whatever lens that somebody is diagnosed with first is the one that sticks with them. So yep. if you go to someone who is an expert in ADHD, and you'll probably get diagnosed with ADHD. And then that's sort of what you sort of carry with you. If you 
go to someone who is an expert in mood disorders and they say, well, you're depressed or, you know, you have this bipolar disorder, um, then that's the only lens that it sort of gets seen through. And that's why we need, why I'm, I'm so glad to be doing this webinar and really kind of bridging that gap and helping people see that, that there is more of that relationship than we're aware of. And, and we do see an attitude, a tremendous number of, of families whose children were diagnosed at an early age with ADHD, who ultimately, as the years play out, turn out to have, well, certainly at least one more disorder, but maybe one more that's more important than ADHD, at least, whether that be bipolar or mood disorder, or autism spectrum, just, you know, many other conditions, which is, yeah. you know, why we're pursuing this these these webinars, because it's clear that the ADHD diagnosis is just the beginning and um, can, as you say, really can stick with someone and, and rule out other more effective um, problems. The kids who are diagnosed with conduct disorder and um, things, you know, those kinds of rages, is that a suggestion to you that the mood disorder should be considered? Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that. That was a good question. Um, yes, that studies do show that children who are diagnosed with a conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder are at higher risk of actually having a bipolar disorder. And in fact, that some studies suggest that the conduct disorder or the ODD might actually be what's called a prodromal bipolar disorder, meaning that it's it actually is the bipolar disorder in child form, um, that it's really, that's the beginning of it, as opposed to they have a conduct disorder that then they'll have the separate diagnosis later of bipolar. Um, it may be that that conduct disorder is the bipolar disorder, but in, in that form. And because they're children, they don't have the same sort of liberties that adults do in the sense that they're children, we can contain children more than we can contain, can contain mm -hmm. adults. So absolutely, that if your child is, is appropriately diagnosed with those, um, and again, with all these diagnoses, it's really, really important to just make sure you're, um, you know, that it's thorough and it's comprehensive because I've also seen people who are diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder um, who are not diagnosed with ADHD. And then it turns out, no, they don't have ODD. They're just someone with ADHD who's in an environment that's so restrictive for them that they just are, they're almost rebelling it. Um, right. Which is very different than somebody who is given the system that they uh, um, give them the tools, but they're extremely opposite different thing. But yes, if someone is, is actually and accurately diagnosed with conduct or oppositional defiant disorder, um, it is indicative that you have to be watchful of a potential mood disorder. Okay. Um, can you uh, question about the difference between, I guess, uh, what this person is describing as an ADD rage, the length of it, the time of it, and a bipolar rage um, and anger? Um, Episode. Yes. So typically what you would see with a bipolar rage is something that um, on another, on a certain given day may not elicit the same kind of response. Whereas parents uh, of ADHD children know uh, basically if they say uh, no more screen time, they know the battle that they're about to engage in. It's basically the same battle like all the time. Um, with, a, with bipolar disorder, sometimes the, the intensity can, is inconsistent. So sometimes it might be an annoyance and other times it's this full on, like to, to a point again, that a lot of times what I'll hear from parents is that they just felt um, scared by it, that it was this unpredictability or this, un, this lack of containment to it. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is the intensity of it, that it's, um, it feels uh, as opposed to them like screaming, let's say, is what someone, let's say a kid, an ADHD adolescent who might be in the throes of that, the person who's bipolar is screaming as if like somebody's killing them. Like it's this intense, like scary, wow. um, almost like 
what what is going on? Like it, it just elicits that response. I've heard that from everybody who um, knows they know it. It's almost like they know that something is different here. Um, it's unlike because even when you talk to other parents with ADHD, you can relate to other parents who have kids with ADHD. If you have a child with ADHD, and I remember a parent saying to me once, you know, I was describing how my son was just ra- he was thirteen and he was raging for six hours, six hours, an unrelenting rage. I mean, nothing, there was no slowing down of this rage for six hours, this exhaustive. And she was describing this to another parent um, who has a child with ADHD. And that parent said, I, that has never happened to me. Like, I mean, the most, you know, he's ever raged is maybe like 20 minutes and then he just gets bored with it when he knows he's not going to get what he wants. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And so ADD can actually work that way. It can almost, you almost eject out of mood states sometimes because you're just literally bored with that mood state on some level. So six hours is clearly, you know, a difference. So there's this intensity um, and it's marked by a lot of destruction. So a lot of Mm -hmm. times these bipolar kids will destroy property. um, They'll yell and they'll say things that are just horrible. And it's literally that they're not, it's almost as if their mind is just taking over because a lot of times these kids, unlike and interestingly with the ADHD kids, they'll often show less remorse sometimes after these kind of tantrums because they'll say, well, you took away my my iPhone and, and that made me upset and you should have just given it to me. The, the kids with bipolar disorder, they will often um, feel a lot of remorse because they know that there's something that sort of took over them. Like they didn't feel in control of it. They didn't feel in control of, you know, saying some of the things that they, they said. So a lot of times when they are done raging, there's almost this like exhaustive collapse and sometimes very regressive behavior, um, like call, crawling up in a fetal position, thumb sucking, um, things like that, that are just, again, really give a sort of disturbing sense to whoever is surrounded by it. Um, But that that's usually what we're referring to is these long and tractable sort of rages that don't, where there's no slowing down and there's no distraction from like someone with ADD, even if in the middle of it, you said, okay, fine. You, here's your iPhone. The person will stop immediately and they'll be like, great. I got what I wanted. You know, it might take them a little time to sort of self soothe and they might still be a little emotionally dysregulated, certainly, but they're going to be able to get grounded very quickly because they got what they wanted. That is not the case with a, a child or adolescent with a mood disorder that it's almost like at that point, it, it's not even about the, the original thing that it's just the train is right, now just takes the station. Over. Yeah. It just takes it's over. It's interesting you say this because on, you know, we see many questions through each week on the, on the webinars that we have. And usually there are one or two people who describe just what you're describing, who say, you know, there's an incredible rage and violence. And it's so far beyond the norm of what most of the parents are talking about that I think it makes sense what you're saying. It's actually not ADHD. It's something else, whether that, whether, but these are folks who generally have been told that it's ADHD. So they're trying to come up with ways to manage this extraordinary rage and on violence. Um, it's very difficult to answer. Yeah. Um, parents saying, what should a parent do when a bipolar child is raging? So basically is to make the environment as safe as possible. So uh, sometimes it's, you know, providing them pillow if, if they're destructive, let's say giving them pillows to punch, uh, giving them a punching bag um, so that they're not punching the dog or they're not punching holes in the wall, which I've seen. I mean, I've worked with kids as young as eight who are literally putting their fists through walls um, because mm. they're in these sort of incredible fits of rage. Um, so providing sort of that kind of outlet. Um, sometimes kids, when they're in that space, respond very well to a lot of sort of pressure. Like it's literally like they need the containment. So sort of a, um, kind of hugging them and squeezing them tight, almost what you would see sometimes at kids who are on the spectrum that sort of need those boundaries because they're, they're just, it's like the emotion is just volcanic. Like there's no, they're almost begging for containment. They're begging for mm-hmm. someone to sort of put it and organize it for them because they are out of control. They cannot do it. So um, sometimes that helps, but 
sometimes that can also exacerbate it if somebody is feeling almost like so energized. So in that case, sometimes in actually engaging their body in some kind of movement um, when they're feeling that could actually be very useful. Um, like I have a, a teen that I'm working with now who when they're in those sort of spaces, uh, the parents actually bought him um, these sort of at a flea market, these two drums, these kind of used beat up drums. And he goes in the basement and he'll bang on these drums. I mean, to the point where he's ripping into, you know, the skins of the drums and the parents just buy new skins, you know, for the, right. the drums. Wow. Yeah. Um, but they, it's not helpful usually at that point to reason because these, the, these individuals are not capable of, taking that in. They're not being bad. They, that this is not a conduct disorder. They're not listening to you and defying you. They are literally overtaken by a mood state. So to mm -hmm. say, stop that, to say, that's not going to do any good. If anything, it's just going to ramp them up more because they're feeling just all of this feeling. So it's being, trying to have a very low tone and saying, I understand, you know, this, you're feeling really bad. Why don't we go outside? And, you know, it could be doing something very physical. Um, you know, I have an adult that I work with where we do these strategies. I have an adult that when he's kind of feeling that sort of hypomanic kind of energy, he goes into his back yard and he digs um, weeds like with a shovel in the ground and like digs and digs and, and, it, and it sort of focuses him. So it kind of provides some containment and it's engaging almost that physical energy that he needs to be doing something. Telling someone to calm down is not going to help when they're in that period. Right. Right. Again, definitely making sure that they're being assessed. And uh, these medications, I mean, these mood stabilizers can be extremely beneficial. Um, and I understand, you know, especially for parents of younger children, um, it, it's a very thorough decision and a very important decision. And I, as a parent, I wouldn't take that decision lightly. Um, these medications can have side effects to them. They can cause weight gain. They can, however, the alternative um, can be much, much worse. So it's just, right. again, right. getting the proper assessment. A couple of weeks ago, we had a presentation, um, which Mary, um, the listener, as points out, um, which talked about the sort of Emo fiery temperament and emotional reactivity of people with ADHD. Um, so she's she's wondering, can you clarify that and that rejection sensitivity is you know all characteristic of the emotional challenges of ADHD? And she's wondering if you can just clarify again the difference between that that sort of fiery reaction, instant sensitivity that is characterized by ADHD with the reaction of a bipolar. A person with bipolar dis mood disorder. Yeah, that typically, so with both bipolar disorder and ADHD, you'll often see individuals who have a very high degree of empathy. Um, my patients who have either or both of these diagnoses are some of the most empathic, sensitive people, um, wonderfully sensitive people that I've ever met. Um, and so there is this sensibility of almost like your emotional center is kind of just raw, you know, to the world. And in, in, in some ways, it shouldn't, it, the answer is not um, taking that away, it's more just providing a shield or a filter rather for that so that things aren't felt so intensely that you can't control it. Um, with ADHD, it's often an emotional reaction that's quite normal, but maybe just a little more intense. So it's often something, again, that people could say, okay, I understand if someone you know broke up with this person, then they're going to be really upset and they're going to have a lot of um, you know, feelings about it. If somebody's in line and they're impatient, that they're going to get very moody as a result of some of these ADHD symptoms, uh, low frustration tolerance and things like that. Mm -hmm. With a bipolar disorder, it again, it, it's often, it could be things like that, but it's much more sort of market, it's more intense. And it's often at times, sometimes that there is no seeming, there is no trigger for it. It's almost that things that again, for that individual would not be a trigger for them a week ago, suddenly is today. And the rejection sensitivity, and this is why you often see the comorbidity with per certain personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder, where the rejection sensitivity is um, almost more to a, uh, sometimes a result of a cognitive distortion that somebody has. So unlike ADHD is if you want to be friends with Mary and Mary doesn't want to 
play with you, you feel rejected, that's going to be a very intense feeling. So for someone with ADHD, there, that there's a, an objective rejection that sort of happened there. For someone with a bipolar disorder, you'll often hear them say things like, well, you know, I walk into a room and and I, I know that this person is thinking this of me. And there's almost these sort of like paranoid, sort of sometimes loose thinking, or, oh, so-and-so didn't call me today. It must mean that they hate me. Um, and mm-hmm. they say things that are like, well, no, it doesn't mean that. And so, or, or maybe it does, but it doesn't have to mean that. And so the rejection sensitivity isn't always so direct. It's often the result of these distortions and these, these thoughts that people with bipolar disorder have that okay. some of which just aren't aren't even true at all. So They're that just not accurate. Quite different from reacting intensely to something that actually happens. You're, yeah, okay. Exactly. Um, exactly. Unfortunately, we're out of time. This is, I think this is really yes. enormously important. I hope we can do part two. Um, I'm going to end with a question from Jackie, which I love. She says, ADHD has the upside because people assume that it means you have great creativity and you think outside the box. Is there any upside to a bipolar diagnosis to feel good about? Well, actually, bipolar diagnosis is marked by um, individuals who are quite creative. I mean, there's a fantastic, I I would actually recommend all of her books, um, a psychologist by the name of Kay Jameson, who wrote a classic book called Unquiet Mind, which is a memoir of her own uh, bipolar illness. She wrote a second book called Touched by Fire, which is about the creativity, the creative temperament of individuals who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder and certain psychotic disorders. Many of our most famous artists throughout history were most likely people who have bipolar disorder. Vincent van Gogh most likely had a bipolar illness. Um, and are individuals who can be quite intelligent, quite gifted, quite empathic. And she wrote another book called Night Falls Fast, which is a phenomenal book about suicide. Um, I just, I'm a big fan of her writing in, in general. But um, yes, that when it's treated and people are getting the right treatment, there is an element to the mind of people who do struggle with this illness, which does lend itself sometimes to very out of the box thinking, very creative thinking, um, as long as it's contained. So yes, if people there, I have many patients who are successful, who are happy, who are healthy, who are married with children, who um, they live with this disorder because it's it's treated. Okay, that's really, really inspiring. Get, get the diagnosis. Thank you so much, Dr. Alvaro, and thank everyone. And thank you to Omega Bright for sponsoring this webinar. And we really thank appreciate you. it. Sure. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit AttitudeMag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.